for their dua. Uh, this, this particular practice is not really uh, legislated. Actually, in the whole 23 years of the Prophet ﷺ, we don't have a single narration, not a single narration where he made dua by raising his hands after the salah. Not even one. Not in the, not in the obligatory or voluntary. So you shouldn't do it. You should not do it, and doing it is a bid'ah. However, some of the ulama say, if in the nafila, voluntary, occasionally, you had the feeling you wanted to make dua, alhamdulillah. But making it a habit, as it is the case with many, this is where it becomes a problem, where they must raise their hands after the salah. So make dua, general dua, no problem, even though the best dua is in the salah, in the sujood, before the taslim, and not after. <coughs> But making afterwards is allowed because we have narrations to that effect. However, it is not done with raising the hands. <coughs> yes. So do we get the same rewards as we get uh, when you're praying? I mean, <coughs> second, second jama, third jama, because on the highways we pray whenever we get the time. Nah. So do we get the same? Yes, sir. Because the Prophet said that the slave, Allah subhanahu wa taala, will write the reward of the slave of the deeds which he used to be consistent of whenever he abandons them, either because of illness or travel. So when you're sick, let's say you're, you're used to praying jama'ah in the first row, in your local masjid. You became ill for three days, you didn't go to the masjid, Allah will give you the reward of the jama'ah even though you're at home. Because you were consistent and you had a preventive, right? Which is the sickness. Sim similarly with travel. Because of travel, then you will be given the reward of whatever you were consistent on doing. In terms of the, the salah of the traveler, then the issue of jama'ah becomes a whole other discussion which is very technically uh, complicated fiqh-wise. But inshallah there's a lot of room in, in the salat al-musafir. The traveler's prayer has, is much more lenient and you don't have to worry about you know, that as much. But if you were to go to a place and now you're re residing there and you hear the adhan, you have to go pray in the jama'ah, in the masjid. Right? And then you will be held accountable for your shortcuts. Once you're not on the road, but on the road in these massages which people pray one jama'ah after the other, ma fi mushkil inshallah. I'm sorry for the joke in the beginning. I <laughs> but you know, people. Nah. Excuse me, sir. Yes, sister. Uh, in Haram, outside of Haram, you try to do the sadaqah, but you don't follow. The rules are not followed. Is it acceptable? I'm sorry, come again? In Haram, when you go to the masjid, outside the masjid, the people read in sadaqah, but the rules don't follow. There are few states, one in and another. The rows that are far away from the Outside. right. Wallah Allah This requires a fatwa. And, and usually whatever, just for everyone's information, uh, predominantly maybe say 99% of whatever is asked, I usually convey fatwa that I have read information which I have come across. I don't give my own fatwa because I'm not qualified to do so. So whenever I'm asked something which I've never come across before, this is where I... Don't answer. And this is one of them things. I've, I've never come across a fatwa that mentions what is the ruling on these people's prayers. So I will not be able to give you an answer. However, I do have access to some of the ulama, alhamdulillah, and students of knowledge. And I could, I, and some resources that are available online, reliable. If you wish to get an answer, just email me, inshallah ta'ala. And I will respond with an, with an answer. Sooner or later, inshallah. If I don't find a fatwa, I will get a fatwa. Uh, again, about uh, uh, Salat al-Jawa. Hey. After the... Khutbah, about resting hands in du'a. This, this is... Uh, After the khutbah, okay. Oh, with the imam, with the imams. <coughs> That's even worse. But, yes, but no, among the imam, I heard big lecture about this, please don't follow me, don't raise your hands, just say, I mean, no one will bother to... To uh, advise the people. To advise, yes. To well, the, the, the Salaf, our righteous predecessors, used to do so. Actually, when one man raised his hands in the du'a on the minbar, one of, the right, one of the righteous brothers there made dua against him in the salah. He reprimanded him in, during the dua. Because what he did was an innovation and it was a position where he wanted to educate the people and not introduce this bid'ah. So then, this act of the imam raising his hands in salah to Jumu'ah during the dua and the ma'mumin raising their hands along with him is unacceptable and not part of the sunnah. Unless it was istisqa. If during Jum'ah he wants to seek rain from Allah, then the Sunnah is to raise the hands. If there's no rain, there's no raising the hands. Not for the Imam, not for the Ma'mumin. You sit down and you say, I mean, to yourself, not screaming, I mean, I mean, I mean, for every dua. Khalas. When he's done, he's done. Nothing else. Don't have to go like this. 
or you know, some people put it down and are afraid that people will see them and they try to have their hands without anyone seeing them. We don't have to do any of that. Just keep your hands however position they were in prior to the dua. Because we don't have any single narration that suggests that we should raise our hands. Not as the imam or the ma'umin during Jum'ah. Even if it's a common practice among many. Now. Uh, uh, during the time of Badr, I mean, uh, there is a hadith, or I, I'm not so sure, I mean, I heard from people. I mean, uh, it says that Rasulullah <coughs> raised his hands towards the uh, uh, sky. And uh, that time, that cloth which was using on the top of head, which fell down, that is one hadith, or something like, you know, arm fit was so white, which was seen. So These are the Istisqa, brother. So this is, the, this, is, this is the kind of... Oh, no, you mean, you mean the Battle of Badr? During the Battle nah, okay, nah. So, uh, I mean, so raising hands, coming from that, or... Uh, Let me go back. What, when I was speaking about raising the hands, I'm not saying raising the hands in and of itself is a bid'ah. We are associating it with another act of worship. Right now, you, on your way home, you have someone driving on your behalf, and you're sitting in the car and you feel like making dua to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Now it is a sunnah for you to raise your hands while making this dua. You follow me? So in this particular occasion, during a battle, during a time of need, where you want to beg Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala for something, raising the hands is a sunnah. We were speaking about people associating this act of worship with another act of worship, where this one becomes attached to the other. Example, as salah wa salah durood sharif. Upon the Prophet Tayyip, is it an ibadah? Is it an act of worship? Indeed. Can you say it during the Fatiha? No. So I say you saying Allahumma salli wa sallam ala Nabina Muhammad is a bid'ah if you say it during Salatul Fatiha. Not the act itself, what it is, it's associated with turns it from a sunnah to a bid'ah. Raising the hands is a sunnah. Doing it after the Salat. Even though the Prophet never did it, makes it a bid'ah. You, you get the point? Zakallah khair. Clear? Yes, sir. Alhamdulillah. Some of the ulama say your wudu is invalid. And some of them say it is fine. If wudu is invalid, salah is invalid. Exactly. But again, this is an opinion of some of the ulama. Some of them say it's just a sunnah to say bismillah. If you forget it, it doesn't affect the validity of the wudu. Allahu Akbar. I personally say it to be on the safe side. If I forget it and I realize in the middle of wudu that I forgot it, I will go back and say it and begin again just to get, get out of the difference because I'm not leaning towards any opinion at the moment, but I play it safe. Now, how do you reconcile Salat al at home? But before that, if you do it at home, you will be late in the masjid. To yes. So it's better to do in the masjid. Probably. In this case, now. Now, in this case, unless you were the imam or in a position where you were, you were fine, that's another story. May I answer the yellow question? This one? Yes. I'm sorry. Can you please mention where the men, uh, where the men get reward for being in the front row? Is it the opposite for the woman? Uh, in, uh, my knowledge is correct. But the sister has the most reward in the back. Right? But again, if, if the masjid has both men and women together, as at the time of the Prophet Muhammad, but if the masjid has a partition or there is upstairs, then the ulama have differed. And some of them say the illa is gone, so then the most rewarding for her is the first row as well. Because the objective of the first hadith is that that close is the worst, is for the men is the back one because they are closest to the women who are in the front. Right? So the ulama have said that in this case, if they are away from the men, then she prays in the first row as well. Wallahu alam. Again, the ulama have differed about this issue. If you want more detail, I can email you the fatwa. When you pray water, about the raising hands in the dua, is you supposed to do that? Yes, it's a sunnah to raise your hand in dua al-kunut al-witr, whether you do 